One day, a friend and I took an Uber. The driver was a friendly man who spoke with a foreign accent. Maybe you can guess the first question my friend asked him. That's right, she asked, where are you from? He said, I prefer not to answer that question. Well, now my friend was really curious and she pressed him. Finally, he said he would tell us at the end of the ride. So for the next 20 minutes, we talked about whether Calgary should host the Winter Olympics, why it was the driver hated to cook, and what he did about drunk passengers. And when we reached our destination, he told us where he'd been born and raised. And then we said goodbye. My friend's question came from genuine curiosity and the best of intentions. But I understood the driver's perspective. My mother, too, speaks with an accent, having left her birth country as an adult. And she hates it when people she's just met ask her where she's from. It's not that she's ashamed of her origins. It's that rather than explore what they might have in common with her, they put this difference right at the center of the relationship. Our driver, too, wasn't ashamed of where he came from. But by withholding this information, he was telling us, first, talk to me without the barrier of what you think you know about me. Begin from scratch. Spend a little time with me before you lean on your assumptions about people from my home country. Even if those assumptions are true, they only reflect one small part of who I am. He was telling us, don't oversimplify me. It's human instinct to reach for categories in our rush to assess a stranger. We're wired to want to leap to conclusions about someone we've just met and to decide whether they're friend or foe. And language and nationality are just some of the signals we grab onto. There are many others. For example, whether someone is wearing a mask or not in the grocery store whether they drive a Tesla or a Ford Ranger, having a certain haircut, wearing jeans high or low, announcing or not the use of preferred pronouns. When we call someone a Karen, for example, we're substituting an entire template of assumptions for the living person in front of us. Making quick judgments is human nature. But we share our society with many strangers who have different accents, experiences, beliefs, and values than we do. And our instinct for quick judgments can be a dangerous one because when we oversimplify, we compromise our ability to cooperate and communicate with each other. And this is especially true if our differences have become politicized. We tend to see people of different political categories as not just different from us, but as enemies. And the thing is that the enemies in our minds may not correspond to the people out in the world. Often, we've replaced people who disagree with us with our cardboard versions of who we think they are. For example, in the United States, a survey showed that both Democrats and Republicans vastly overestimated the extent to which members of the other party held extremist views. On average, people believed extremist views to be about twice as prevalent as they really were. Just as with accents, once we've sorted someone into a political category, we think we know more about them than we really do. So our Uber driver was right. We need to set aside what we think we know about each other to make room for all the things we don't know. Being someone who writes and thinks and reads for a living, my solution was to found a special book club in Calgary. Every month for several years, we met to share our thoughts on a 
book about a political subject. And we called our book club, How Can You Think That? <laughs> this was a humorous way to acknowledge that sense of bafflement that we often feel when we encounter someone who has a view that's alien to us. But it also reflected an important goal for our group, to bring a real curiosity about others and what led them to think the way that they do. At one of our early meetings, I proposed an activity. I designated one side of the room as the most liberal end of the political spectrum and the other side of the room as the most conservative end. And I asked people to place themselves in the room depending on their position on a variety of political issues. For example, abortion, affirmative action, gay marriage, and so on. And guess what happened? People moved around a fair bit, depending on the question. So someone who started at one end of the room on gay marriage might move closer to the center, or even towards the other end of the room on an issue like abortion, or vice versa. We were surprised at the unpredictability of everyone's positions. We learned we couldn't make assumptions about each other. We learned that most of the time, people's positions, including our own, are not one-dimensional. They're complicated, even conflicted. And this complexity is also human nature. We're not members of just one tribe. Each one of us is an amalgam of a variety of different influences and allegiances. This is something I've been aware of all my life because I suffer from the mirror image of the problem experienced by the Uber driver and by my mother. I was born in the same country as my mother, but because I moved to North America as a child, I don't have an accent that announces my heritage. When people hear my mother, they hear the differences between their experiences and hers. When people hear me, they often don't hear that I can sometimes feel out of place in my adopted country. But my mother and I both need the same thing. We need the freedom to be our complicated, ambiguous selves. The freedom to feel like we belong, even though we're sometimes we're different from those to whom we're loyal. At our monthly book club meetings, I realized that others, too, have the same need to preserve their own complexity. Our meetings weren't just a way for us to learn about others. They were also a way for us to resist the pressure to oversimplify ourselves. Members of the group talked about how, at the book club, they felt free to probe and question some of their values and beliefs in ways they might not be able to do with members of their own political tribe where they felt they had to unambiguously signal their loyalty. This pressure to self-simplify is a consequence of sorting people into categories. If your world is populated by cardboard enemies, it becomes really important to present yourself as unambiguously as possible, using language, clothing, flags, whatever you can to identify yourself to your tribe and repel your enemies. But like our Uber driver, we need to be doing exactly the opposite. Political scientists have found that people who see themselves as multidimensional are less likely to become politically radicalized. When people feel they belong to more than one group whose values and beliefs sometimes clash with each other, they're less likely to be provoked into anger by a political opponent. Unfortunately, the research also shows that in recent years, people have been sorting themselves into simpler and simpler categories, giving up their tangled social networks and complicated loyalties. It's becoming easier to predict someone's opinion on a variety of different political issues if you know their position on one. And when this happens, it gets harder to find common ground across the growing divide. 
Political resistance is often framed as the mobilization of a mass movement against a common enemy. And I gotta admit, sometimes this is very necessary. But I came to realize that our little book club was also a form of political resistance. It was a resistance against the rising tide of oversimplification of others and ourselves. It was a resistance that nurtured the skills of democracy and practiced them month after month. It was a resistance that left us feeling connected and hopeful when both were in short supply. Throughout the pandemic, we've been deprived of the kinds of human interactions we most need to have. As we come face to face with each other now, I hope we can resist the urge to grasp at what we think we know about the person in front of us and leave room for all the things we don't know. I hope we can heed the wisdom of the Uber driver. Begin from scratch. Thank you. <laughs>